is my promise. So I'm back on this bathroom floor again. And it's the middle of the night again, and flashes of your face keep me up again. It's you, Abigail. You have stained my soul. Is it a street worker? Is it a sex worker? You tell me, what is the politically correct way to say that my 11-year-old friend Abigail is a war orphaned prostitute? Yes, this $2 hooker, this child, she opens her legs to men so that she can stay alive. And right now, I'm not sure if she's alive. And when I think about her, I don't have the words to describe. My friend Abigail is missing. She is gone. She is nowhere to be found. And when I call her name, nobody knows her. Her community tells me, matter-of-factly, she's vanished. Her country shushes me. It's not good for their reputation. My country tells me it's not polite to talk about her. Here, she is the blame of a corrupt government in a country that people know nothing about. Here, she is just another abstract thought that would never cross someone's mind on a line to purchase a cup of coffee that costs more than she would make selling herself for one day. Here, she is just another Facebook cause that people might check they like because it's trendy or because it's easy. She is the bottom of the earth to a world that has been brutal to her, that has beat her up and raped her in ways that people who could read would never be able to pronounce. Now this small child is gone, and I've promised her that I would come and find her, and I can't. So I'm up again, on this bathroom floor again, and it's the middle of the night again, and I need to scream her name. Abigail, where are you? I'm trying to find you. I haven't forgotten you. I am struggling to find words to talk about you. People here are offended by you, disturbed by you. I am too. You keep me up at night, and I hope that you always do. You are my vow, my promise. I'm coming to get you. So I moved to Liberia about 10 years ago. It was my first job outside of college. And I didn't know much about Liberia. I had to Google it, and I found out all of these crazy statistics. One of them was that, or, or facts, one was that Liberia was formed by freed American slaves. So they had, there's this relationship between Liberia and the United States. They have a US flag with one star instead of 50. It's called Liberia, meaning liberty, because of the freed slaves that formed it. Um, it's also, they speak, primarily speak English, and they even, their capital is named after our fifth president. It's called Monrovia, after James Monroe. It also experienced one of our world's most brutal civil wars, and I moved there just a few years after it happened. I'm like a big kid myself, and I love children, so I would come to the capital city, and I would meet these kids, and they were on the streets, and they were selling. They were, this is Evelyn, and, and, and they were selling they were hauling coal, they, were, they had wheelbarrows of handmade soap and used underwear and water and bananas, and they were working. And because I'm a big kid, I would make friends with them. And we would play all kinds of games, and we would have pillow fights, and we would draw donkeys in the sand, Liberia's on the ocean, and we would spin and spin and spin and spin and spin and spin, and we would fall on the ground, and we would look at each other, and I would say to these kids, if you could have anything in the entire world, what would it be? And over and over and over again, these children would tell me, we just want to go to school. Well, I didn't really love school growing up, so I, you know, I wanted to understand more. Why don't they want to go to school? At the time, school wasn't free. And I, you know, and I, I realized if a young girl was on the street selling, oftentimes that she would get sucked into a life of sexual exploitation. So I was doing everything I could help, do to help them go to school. I was using MySpace, which was cool back in the day. And I was telling their stories, and people were wiring me money to Liberia. And this New York City tax attorney, she, she saw what I was doing, and I had seven kids in school, and it turned to 30, and she said, you know what? You really need to make this like a legitimate organization, make a 501c3. And I remember going to my best friend and saying, you know, I don't think I'm smart enough, or celebrity enough, or pretty enough, or this enough, or that enough. And he looked at me right in the face, and he gave me the best advice I've ever had in my entire life, and he looked at me and he said, Katie, 
get over yourself. <laughs> it's not about you. And I played that in my head over and over and over again. It's not about you. It's not about you. So I named my organization more than me. So the president of Liberia, she's the first female president in Africa. She's a little bit intimidating, a little bit. <laughs> I ended up, she invited me to her house. She heard what I was doing, and I'm sitting in her gazebo, and I'm trying to make her laugh, and she wouldn't laugh. But she said very solemnly, she said, thank you for your service to my country. And she said, as long as you're serving the children of Liberia, you can have this building <laughs> for free. <laughs> I said, thank you very much. Uh, I, I thought two things. One, oh my goodness, the president gave me a free building. This is so cool. And I also thought, oh my God, how the heck am I going to fix this thing up? And uh, at the time, I didn't really know any wealthy people. I was throwing these events, and that's how I was fundraising in the beginning. Many years, you know, a few years ago, many years ago, and I ended up on this primetime television show. It almost sounds like I'm lying to you. This is a true story. And it was Chase American Giving Awards, and they give away a million dollars every year to an organization, one of 25 organizations, that gets the most amount of likes on Facebook. Well, I was, on this, I was invited to be on this primetime television show, and it's unbelievable, but I actually won a million dollars. I almost fell... <laughs> I almost fell on the ground. Joe McCall told me, you need to have a career in screaming. <laughs> and so then uh, I went back to Liberia. We fixed up the building. And on the best day of my entire life, it was my birthday. My mother flew in from New Jersey. It was her first time in Africa. The president of Liberia was there. And all my students were there. And we cut the red ribbon for, this, for our, the first free girls' school in Liberia. It was amazing. <laughs> We had all these, we had all kinds of services and, and it was like, it wasn't just the school, it was like we had mental health and nutrition and, you know, technology and we had a, you know, deworming program and everything you can imagine and the girls were leaping forward some two grade levels ahead and then Ebola hit and we had a decision to make. We were either going to say, we're an education organization, peace, and wait to see what happened to our girls or we were gonna fight with everything we had to make sure that our girls stayed alive. It was one year ago, I was there on the front lines and one of the, the, the craziest things that ever happened in our generation. Um, so the best way for me to actually discuss this is to share with you what I was posting on the front lines from Instagram. I'm just gonna share a couple photos with you. These are more bags than I've ever carried to Liberia before. Brussels Air donated everything, they're pretty cool. There are only a few of us on this plane right now. It's me and a couple CDC people. I'm waiting to talk to the staff at Doctors Without Borders. I'm asking them to help inside of West Point where our students live. I see 30 body bags with people in them in the corner. I'm terrified, but I have complete peace. I'm inside of the quarantine zone of West Point. This is one of my students, Mahoa. She ran up to hug me, but there's no touching right now. She wants to be a police officer one day. Dear God, please use me and our team to keep her safe. When the people of West Point call for an ambulance, it takes four days to get someone to respond. That is not okay. We bought an ambulance. Let's do this. Here in our school, the ambulance drivers are being trained by the staff from WHO, many of whom our fathers are dead, are, who are the fathers of our students. A man, a teenage boy, and a woman in the back of an ambulance. They want to be admitted, but there are no open beds. In the midst of all of the awful things going on, I found Regina playing dress up in the slum. Kids will be kids. An entire family is sick. The baby is on the verge of death, and all of the treatment units are full. This is the hardest day of my entire life. Sometimes I don't know what else to do, so I just start singing Liberian gospel songs. It seems to make the people happy. When will this nightmare be over? I will never forget this for the rest of my life. This sweet pumpkin just watched her mother die in front of her inside of the ambulance. 
I can't imagine what's going through her mind. She has no symptoms, but her community was afraid to take her in. We're not sure if she has Ebola or not, but she doesn't have any symptoms. If she goes in, she will definitely die. I have to take her. I cannot leave her here. We converted our guest house into a safe zone and quarantined sweet Perlina with Disney movies and ice cream. She misses her mom, but she is safe and healthy. We're counting, and it's day number five. Today's stories and pictures are really dark. I fight in myself to know if I should share them or not. The Liberian people tell me to show the world what's really going on, so I'm posting. Perlina's test results came back, and she is negative. OMG, what an emotional roller coaster this has been. I started to show all the symptoms myself. I called my friends at Doctors Without Borders, and they told me I needed to come in for a test. Right in front of me, this person in a hazmat suit is trying to feed the little girl. I just got through talking to this woman. I was telling her that she was going to make it praying and singing to her, and all of it was lies. She's dead now, right next to me. This is not okay. This is Esther. She survived Ebola. Her entire family did not. I got a call that this 10-year-old child was sick. She's already lost her dad and her little 7-year-old sister in October. Pray for Sarah that she will make it. She seems really strong. I dropped her off at the treatment unit. I gave her two teddy bears and a telephone. I told her to drink all of her water and to fight with everything that she had. She walked down this hallway and she never came back again. Her mother will never get to say goodbye. I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. I just looked at her mother. My lips started to quiver. I put my head down, and I started to weep. Her mother got the picture, and she fell on the ground, and she started to shake. I'm in my room now. I just want to be alone. I am angry, disgusted, and embarrassed by our world. How could we let this happen to one another? This will never be okay until we make sure that it will never happen again. It was not Sarah's time to go. She is not coming back. This hell on earth has changed me in ways that I'm not even sure of. I'm stronger, less concerned about what other people think, more focused on what matters. I keep seeing flashes of the horrors that I've been witnessing, but then I think about the survivors like Esther, all they have lost, but they have life, and I have life, and we must use it to our maximum. So after five months on the front lines of Ebola, I came back to the States, and I really had to do some soul searching. I mean, you're not the same person after you witness that much death in front of you, especially when it happens to small children. And I asked myself the question, my girls in our school are the reason, you know, why I do everything. But if I invest all of my time and all of this money into our school, but Liberia itself is not secure and isn't stable, our girls are never safe. And I realized that the only way that our girls are ever going to have a secure future is if Liberia itself has a secure future. And that starts with rebuilding education. So I went to the Minister of Education in Liberia, and I said, how can I help you? And he said a couple things. He said, one, all of these programs that you have at your school, can, we, can more than me help create model schools in every single county? And I said, well, come, you know, let's go take a look. And so we went on this trip, and I just got back, and we went around you know, to the counties to see the conditions of schools in Liberia, and it's horrendous. And we all know that. But you know, the number one thing that was asked for was chairs and roofs. And students, they don't even have the materials that they need. This was a classroom where two, this is pretty normal. They have two classes going on at one time. They don't have the necessities that they need. It's a miracle that anybody learns anything in these circumstances. 
Um, but Liberia does have one of the lowest literacy rates in the world. And I believe what's scarier than Ebola are the conditions that allowed for Ebola to have the toll that it did. And until we change that, the country will always be vulnerable and our girls will never be safe. So I asked the minister, yes, we can work with you to create model schools in every single county. But what is, you know, how much do you really need? What is it going to take to rebuild the entire education system? And he goes, you know, Katie, his name is Minister Warner. I, you know, I think about this all the time, and he said, it, it costs about, and he showed me a budget, it's $200 million to fix the education system in Liberia, and I was thinking, what? And I, you know, I'm from the state of New Jersey. <laughs> I'm from the state of New Jersey. There's 8 million people in New Jersey. If only 4 million people, there's 4 million people in Liberia, if 4 million people in my state gave $4 a month for one year, that would equal $192 million. I was like, we can totally do this. So <laughs> that's the mission that I'm on. And uh, everyone tells me it's impossible. Everyone says, you're never going to get 4 million people to give you $4. It's $50 one time. You're never going to rebuild the education system in Liberia. This is impossible. And you know what? They told that to Nelson Mandela, too. And you know how he, re he replied? He said, it always seems impossible until it's done. Now let's go do it. In memory of Sarah and in behalf of Abigail, thank you very much. <laughs>